This is Road to the Golden Door, where we unpack the proven success formula straight from the minds of Golden Door winners, uncovering the motivation, methods, and the mindset it takes to become an elite performer in door-to-door -door sales and in life. This is Road to the Golden Door. Now, here's your host, Mikey Lucas. All right, what's up? Welcome back, Road to the Golden Door. I've got Marshall Hawks here, and a pretty interesting story. So if you don't know who Marshall is, um, you're going to want to listen up and get a notepad out because Marshall is the uh, opposite of what uh, you would think. Um, Marshall has hit a, is a double Golden Door Award winner. Um, at In 2019, actually hit the, uh, the, the per contract value, the highest per contract value record um at his at his company fox pest control in his rookie year and hit over 1200 accounts service 1200 accounts uh i see a lot of guys hitting like 600 500 in their first year 400 when that's outstanding uh and this kid came in and uh did it a double year basically in one year uh the funny thing is uh he was a rookie so marshall uh, looking forward to, to jamming with you. There's a lot of stuff that we have in common. Um, now followed you for the last, I guess you can say year now. And, uh, just, I love your story and I'm looking forward to, uh, to adding some value to, uh, to the industry. So welcome to the show. Yeah. Marshall. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So dude, tell me, uh, tell, uh, for the listeners that don't know who Marshall Hawks is, uh, why don't, why don't you tell them, why don't you tell them who you are? Yeah. Uh, 27 years old, just, uh, living out here in Utah. Uh, Bountiful Utah's home. Um, been in the door-to-door -door space now for seven years. Uh, started doing solar um, after getting home from a mission. So I went on two-year mission for my church. Uh, lived in Tokyo, Japan. Learned the language of Japanese. And then came home, dove right into sales, and uh, I've never looked back. So I've been in, been in the door-to-door -door space for a while now. Um, made the change from solar to pest. And... Uh, found a home with Fox and, and now just living here. So awesome. So obviously if the listeners are like, wait, 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 what you, you, you went from solar to pest. Why would you do that? Pest control guys make no money. That's obviously what everybody hears. Um, but if you listen to this show, you know that I always tell people, especially all the guys that we've, uh, we've interviewed here that are on, in, in pest control. And I always say like, look, like if, if, if pest control guys didn't just work the summer months, you guys would wait, way more money than so, most solar people, like most of them. Um, so what, tell me why, why, why did you, we were talking off mic, but why did you go from solar, which is supposed to be the highest commission sales job, all these guys driving Bugattis to pest? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, there was a couple factors at play. Um, I saw a lot of things coming down the pipe that are starting to happen within the solar space um competition just started to take you know ramp and uh and i had a comp I, I i basically had a competition with my buddy um on uh who could make more he was doing pest control i was doing solar now when i was doing solar it was between just college semesters so you know you look at these guys today they're doing solar they're really doing it year round um as kind of a career path and i wasn't in that position i was going to college so i was just being a closer closing deals as much as i could during the school or in between semesters and uh basically he beat me on that on that friendly bet that we had and kind of opened my ears up to you know how fast and how much you can make in kind of concentrated short period of time um so there's a lot more to it but that's kind of the short answer to it yeah definitely in 2017 2018 there was talks of Utah shutting down, Nevada shutting down, Arizona shutting down, California was going to be shutting down. Like, so I, I understand um, the long term, uh, long term sustainability. Did you uh, only work in solar in Utah at that time? Is that is that all? Did you go any? Did you travel other than? No, it was just in Utah. Yeah, and I think part of my mindset was was also I wanted to open a business of my own someday. You know, me getting into the door to door space, similar to a lot of guys that get into it. 
it wasn't a long-term play. I did. I had zero intentions of being in the space for more than maybe two to three years. And so when I got into it, that was my mindset. And uh, when I started looking at pest control, I also saw, you know, a route to, hey, if it does work out, um, the barriers of entry to just being able to open a small pest control company, whether that's of my own or, you know, with a company. So. Awesome. Um, looks like you just bought your first house too. I was looking at your Instagram a second ago. Did you just buy your first house too? No, I, this is my second house that I just got into, but the, the, the first one's just a rental. So it wasn't so as meaningful. We'll get into that. We'll, we'll get into that. So the how this house you, you built, is this the one you're going to be living in? You're living in now, or is this a, uh, is that, is that your, your primary residence? In other yeah. Words? The one I just got is my primary. Yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. So you did, you, you did a little house hacking. Did you rent out the first house, buy, buy and live in it, rent out the rooms kind of thing? Like what did you do there? Yeah. So I want, like real estate's always been a passion of mine. So I kind of wanted to learn like the ins and outs and be inside of it. So my first house, I bought it, um, rented out the upstairs while I remodeled the whole downstairs, converted the basement into a mother-in-law apartment, put in a separate entrance, kitchen, the you know, the full deal. And then uh, after, it took me about a year to renovate it um, on my own, just moved out, got another house, so. Nice, dude. Now it's all rented out. Is it three different tenants technically at that time now, or is it? It's just, a, it's a duplex, yeah. So it's got a mother-in-law and then a upstairs lease, so. Nice, dude. That's awesome. Cool. Yeah, we'll have to jail on that too. I'd like to like to pick your brain on that stuff, man. Uh, love real estate myself. Um, got a uh, handful of properties, a um, handful of uh, multifamily, single family. So and some commercial and I actually have some land right now too. So cool, man. We'll, uh, we'll jam into that. So tell me, uh, let me bring me, bring me back to um, this 2019 year where you hit 1200 accounts, 1200 plus accounts. Um, I mean, what was going on in your mind? I mean, you just came from doing solar. What did you make in that, that 2018 year? I know that you said you're just in between semesters, but what did you make in the year of 2018 for solar? So I made about 180. Yeah, about 180 doing solar in 2018 before making the jump to go to past. I'll make sure I cut that out because you probably, um, I'll cut that out. So that the IRS doesn't look at us and be like, wait a second, he only, well, 180 plus after your fee. Oh, that, that's after that. all the write offs, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, uh, that's a, that's a topic for another conversation. That's so funny. Um, okay. So about 180 and then, and then you came into your, your first year pest, um, and hit 1201 accounts. I mean, was it like natural? Cause I mean, obviously as solar, it's a hour and a half, two hour consultation, so tell me about that. Like, well, I mean, twelve hundred accounts is not not yeah. easy to do that. So explain to me that going from the two hour hour and a half consultation, if not three hour consultation, to a what does it take? Fifteen minutes? Yeah. yeah, five five if you're good. Five ten minutes, you know, five minutes selling them, five minutes solidifying them. But um, no, it's kind of a bittersweet um, feeling when I look back at twenty nineteen doing twelve hundred accounts. It's kind of bittersweet to be honest because. Um, well, I, like I look back and I'm so happy about what I was able to achieve. I feel like I did leave so much on the table, um, not knowing what I was really doing. So what a lot of people don't know is that year, my goal was not to do 1200. In fact, my goal at the beginning of the season was to do 600 because here I am, I'm leaving a job doing solar that I've had a lot of success with and I've got to make that change be worth it. So I've got to at least make what I was making doing solar plus some um, for the sacrifices I was going to have to go through to do so. And uh, so I made my goal that I was going to do 600 accounts that year. And it just so happened that I was working and living um, pretty much in the same apartment with uh, my best friend at the time, Jerem Scholes, who he had been with Fox for five years. He was going on year six. And he had made the decision that he wanted to do a thousand accounts because apparently a thousand accounts was like this holy grail of holy grails. I yep. didn't know that. Here I am. I'm, I'm walking in. He's got this goal of doing a thousand accounts. Two weeks into selling that summer, I get a phone call from like six or seven different people within the company. Dude, you need to go for a thousand. 
you need to change your goal right now. If you don't change it today, you're never going to get it. And I was like, okay, I guess I'll change my goal. Um, and I think part of that was because I was kind of keeping pace with, with, with him. You know, we were both uh, selling about the same. So it was just a matter of time and consistency. Hmm. That's interesting. So you had basically a running mate. Yeah. Okay. So I don't, I don't want to skip that. I want to kind of dive into that really quickly. So you're telling me that you had somebody to basically compare to that you could run with. It's almost, I, I don't know if you've look, uh, heard about that or not, but it, apparently in like Olympic athletes and these top runners, they've got somebody that's just as fast as them and runs with them, but doesn't make it into the Olympics for some reason. I don't know why, but they don't, but they're just as fast as them. And it makes them run, makes the, the you know, Usain Bolt run faster. So to, the, dive into that a little bit for me. Like that is a huge, Huge nugget. Guys, listen to this. Marshall, explain to me again what what that did for your summer. Well, yeah, so I ran track all throughout junior high, high school. Um, we, we call it a pace setter, right? So the guy who starts the mile and he, he or whatever the race is, usually it's long distance, it's not a sprint, and goes out and sets the pace for the first one or two laps of the race. And, and so those runners know this is the speed in which I need to keep if I'm going to run the time I want to run. And so it was, it was a huge, for, like, it was a huge blessing to have somebody who had already sold pest control for four or five years, who was at a high elite level in that industry, who was going for a thousand accounts. Cause I simply just got to live with him and do what he was doing. And if I just copied exactly what he was doing, then I would sell hopefully close to what he was going to sell. And uh, there was a lot of good that came from that. Um, I look back and knowing what I know now, I'm like, ah, man, my process, there were so many things that the two of us could have done so much better and been so much more effective at. And we left so much money on the table. But, and so that's why I call it bittersweet. That it's like, it's sweet because I had such a great opportunity that most reps won't have to be able to just jump into a different space, go from solar to pest and go run, go run with, you know, one of the greatest. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting, the pace setter. Um, I, I mean, I guess we can jump right into that um, with your, with your office now, your region now. Is that we call in solar, we call that a, a sales rabbit. Someone that's someone that goes out and sells consistently 10 to 12 deals a month. Consistent. That's the sales rabbit. They go out there, they're, they're throwing in three to four deals every single week, no matter what steady Eddie, 10 deals, 12 deals every single month, never really the top guy, but consistently sells 10, which shows the younger guys that are younger in the industry, you know, that, Hey, look, you know, this guy steady, steady Eddie over here. He can hit 10, you can hit 10, right? Nothing special about him, just consistent. So you had that, you live with this kid mm -hmm. too? Yeah. Lee, what was that like? That was great. I mean, we, we, I mean, like, what was the routine? Like, you guys just like, what, wake up, go to the gym, go to work? Yeah, our, our routine could have been a lot better. I think, like, there was days we, dude, we hit 1200 accounts. How much better could it have gotten? I, I honestly think it could have, well, it started, it started off good. Let's just say it started off good. It didn't end well. Um, half, halfway through the summer, you know, we're, we're twiddling our thumbs waiting for someone to get out of the apartment, you know, and yeah. uh, some days he'd be the first to get out and then I'd follow with. And some days I'd say, hey, I got to be the first to leave because he doesn't have, you know, what it, what it takes to get out today first. So it was, it was good to have somebody that could help you know, pull this, pull, pull your slack out of your, out of your rope in a sense and get you to work. So. How much did he hand with? He serviced, um, a thousand six. Nice. How many months is that? Uh, he was out for five and a half months. You were, uh, five. That's really impressive, bro. If anybody's not, if anybody's listening, and doesn't understand how hard it is to do 1200 accounts in pest control. Like that is, 
That is ungodly. Like it is so much pest control accounts. It's it's insane. Um, Marshall, you uh, you're one of the you're one of the few. You know, you're you're one of the few the proud the twelve hundred Marines over here. Um, wow, dude, that's a it's really impressive, dude. So you served a mission. You got into solar. You switched over to pest. You got in with the you got in with the pace setter. You hit your twelve oh one. You hit records the second year. 2020 COVID hit. What'd you go through? What was going on in your mind? Well, 2020 was the year we opened. So we opened our branch that year. Um, you know, I, I, my focus, it kind of went from personal sales, knocking, trying to sell as many as I could to building something long lasting um, that was going to create a, a residual income for me in essence. Uh, whether I knock or not. And uh, it, was a, it was scary at first, obviously. I mean, we had a lot of reps that kind of got go- cold feet. I think we had like 80 some odd reps that we had signed that season um, going into 2020 um, and only landed like 35. Um, so kind of a crazy off season to try to open a branch to say the least. Um, yeah, for know. real. But uh, it was a great year. I mean, COVID, Anybody that was on the doors knows this, you know, everybody was home. So, and in, pe- and in pest control, the more people are home, the more they get to see the problems that they get in their house, you know, so. So how did your, how did your guys do then that, that, that year? Yeah. So we, um, as a branch and I take no credit, this is the credit of our team. Uh, we set the record in Fox for uh, not only being the fastest branch out of debt, we were able to get out of debt in one year, uh, which had never been done in that time. And uh, we're the top branch in the company. Um, I think we did about 3.2 million that first year. So, Yeah, that's a lot. First year coming off of a golden door. Um, how many reps did you guys have or how many reps did you get, were you over at that point? Well, we started the summer, I think with like just a little over 30 and ended with yeah. you know somewhere in the mid 20s. What, I guess, was there a pace setter? I mean, did you, did you, what were some of the lessons you learned in that year? Obviously COVID, um, was it right away? You guys were like, Hey, no worries. Let's keep moving forward. Fox was like, Hey, cool. I mean, let's not, not to get like, you know, to call them out or whatever, like, like, were they like, Hey, don't worry about it. Just keep moving forward. Or is it like, you know, how, did, how was their, how was their handling of the whole COVID thing? Cause obviously I was in door to door. I ran my own company at that time too. Um, just so you know, we did better that we went up like 36% that year, year over year growth. I mean, it was like, and we had like a whole month that was like, there was almost no sale, not no sales, but like it was very low. Yeah. So like, what, what was, what was Fox's, uh, what was Fox's um, like approach on that? What were they telling you guys? Like where, where, where were they at? Were they, Hey man, what was up with that? Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of uncertainty because I mean, COVID kind of broke out in March, I think is when it started to um, really take big effect. And we, is that when Utah got shut down? Did Utah get shut down in March? I don't know if Utah got entirely shut down, but, um, states out in the East coast where we were looking at opening our branch, New York state, all of New York got shut down. So literally yeah. Fox had to relocate like a hundred sales reps to different markets because they just couldn't go to New York. Um, they weren't yeah. issuing permits. They weren't doing anything, uh, which is crazy. So um, there was a lot of uncertainty and, uh, what, around whether or not we were, it was the right time to open. We had the reps, we had the amount of sales force that you would need to, to have a successful first year as a, as a branch and put you on the right direction to get out of debt. Um, but yeah, it could, it, it was kind of a question, is it going to get better? Or is it going to get worse? You know, and where's the country going to go in a few months? You know, so, uh, we opened. Fortunately, we actually, we hired our branch manager uh, two weeks into the summer, which normally you hire that guy a few months before the summer. So he can staff up and train your technicians and everything. But we, we had to, we had to hire him in the, in the middle of the summer. So, but hey, it all worked out. Interesting. Some of the biggest lessons or hurdles you ran into in your first year operating your own dealer? Yeah, I think some of the biggest challenges were, um, or lessons that I learned is just, 
Um, you can either be affected or you can affect. And um, I think in the beginning portion of that COVID year, a lot of us felt um, felt trapped to being affected and saying, oh, well, let's here's an excuse for this or this is a perfect excuse for that. Um, but we realized that um, that we really impose our will on the marketplace um, in the door-to-door -door space. And we're going out to that customer to meet them, to bring our product or service to their attention and get them to buy. And uh, so, yeah, that was probably a big lesson is don't be affected. You know, go go on the on the attack, not the defense. Yeah, I think that that really separated the uh, the door to door guys. Um, you know, we we really just kind of pushed through, right? It's like we, I mean, you guys were deemed essential. We were deemed essential. Roofers were deemed essential. The alarm guys were deemed essential. Like we're pretty much good to go. We we got the uh, we got the go ahead and started we started running. I mean felt privileged in a way to be able to continue to keep our job. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's really, it's really interesting. So, all right. I still, I still, oh man, I'm still, con I'm still not confused, but so the next, okay. So the next year, the next year, 2021 it was your second year. You guys are out of debt now. What did you change from 2020 to 2021 going going into? Are you still in Utah at this point? And what did you what did you do there? Yeah, so our branch is not in Utah. I live in Utah. Our headquarters is out here in Utah, but we opened a branch out on the East Coast, close to Philly. So, um, so every summer we would take our reps out that way. Um, but what? Philadelphia. Huh? Yeah. Yep. Nice. Um, so what did I change from 2020 to 2021, the COVID year? Because yeah. um, obviously at that point, we're like, okay, cool. One mask, two masks, one shot, five shots, 10 shots. We're drunk on, uh, you know, the juice, if you will. Um, yeah, what were, you guys, what were you guys doing now? Was your customers, you know, less affected? I didn't sell in the East Coast at that time frame. So what was it like over there? Yeah, so, I mean, with COVID, you had a lot of people that were like, they had uncertainty about their job and about income and about, and so people are just kind of sitting tight, I felt, and they are even today right now, especially, but um, they were definitely sitting tight a little bit. And so we had to, we had to make the change from just delivering a good service to, to also building a good relationship. Um, so as a business, we went from focusing on how can we sell as many accounts to how can we sell as many solid accounts? Um, because your first year, you 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 really in pest control, you want to sell as many accounts as you can in your first year. Like revenue is what matters at the end of the day in that first year. And you should you should put emphasis on good accounts, solid accounts that are going to stay on and stay for the long term. But year two, we we realized. Um, Hey, these people that are sitting tight, they're going to cut back on their expenses and they're going to cut us as one of those expenses if we don't have a deep, meaningful relationship between the company and the customer. And so we put a lot of emphasis on folk and focus on technicians, making sure their customer was home, showing up to that customer's house, offering to go above and beyond. We did an initiative called What Else? So, you know, hey, is there anything else I can help you with? Or finding, not even asking, but oh, you notice that their garbage cans are down by the curb and you're their technician, bring them in, bring them up to the house, you know, or their garbage cans are full, bring them out to the curb, you know, sit down, spend some time with the old grandma, build that relationship because if they don't see your face, it's that much easier to just get rid of you. Yep. So, yeah, no, I agree. Wow. That's really cool. Tell me about that then. Um, wh why, like, what was a, what was a process? Who trained that? Who came up with that and, and, and what were some successes you guys saw in that or were some failures in that? Because here's the thing, in, in my personal in my personal solar business, I was 52.6% referral. So when it came to actually like customer service and like relationships, like, dude, I, I hit the ball at the park every single time. I've got a whole software on that. It's called, it's called, basically it's, 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 
it's called golden or formula, but basically what it is, is it's a referral platform. And what it does is it helps customize really the relationship with the homeowner after the service, which is a very key point there. So tell me what, like, what was, what was that process look like? How do you, like, how do you train a new sales rep that like, Hey man, you're not just here for the money. You're here to, you're here to like actually service. Like this person has a life like, you know, Hey, look, like the, for instance, the old lady, right. But that's like the easy one to go with. But what was the training? Like, what was the, what was the feedback? Like you guys got when that started happening? Did you get, did your technicians, did your sales reps feel like they would be on board with that? Or was it more of like a, Oh man, you're asking me to do another thing here. Like what was the culture like around that? Yeah. So I think it was a lot easier to train technicians than it was to train sales reps because <laughs> technicians, um, anybody who's in pest control, knows that technicians pay relies upon the retention of their route. So if they have a lot of their customers that are on their route that aren't happy, that are canceling, that are following, that are falling off, it's going to affect their end end of day take home pay. A, a sales rep, you know, unless he's got buy-in on the company or he looks outside of himself. Right. And I felt, I felt I'll, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that because I felt trapped to it my first year a little bit is um for example when i was selling 1200 accounts i used to think that hey like i'm out here to protect my to provide for myself before i am to provide for the company right like you're always going to put yourself a little bit ahead of the company but if you can if you can learn to do both effectively what ends up happening is you you bring so much more value out of your potential than you would otherwise and you perform at higher levels because you have that buy-in to what you're actually selling and the company that you work for. And people in the company start to see that and you get valued um, or people put more value on you as a member of that company. So I remember when I was selling uh, my first year, you know, I was having all these big days and um, I can't remember exactly what the problem was, but I got a call from somebody. And what I would, what I had been saying to people was, um, and this was like in the first month of me ever selling pest control, right? Still learning the ropes, still figuring it out is every once in a while, I would say the phrase, Hey, if you like us, keep us. If you don't at the end of your contract, kick us to the curb. Right? So I'm like, Hey, if you like us, try us out, see if you like us. If you do great, keep us. If not, get rid of us. And somebody talked to me about that and they said, whoa, 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 whoa. Like you do realize that you're a high level sales rep, that the owner of your branch is probably not making hardly anything on your account unless that account stays on for two or three or four years. Like in the first year of that account, once the commissions are paid and the technicians paid and everything's covered expense wise, the owner of the branch is making nothing unless that customer usually stays on. And that's the case for high level sales reps. And once I knew that I felt so bad, I was like, Holy cow. Like how greedy of that is, how greedy of me is that to just like only look out for myself and not the person who's given me the job in which I'm working. And so, um, we were able to achieve that with some of our sales reps as well as that mindset shift for me that first year to, to going to solidifying the account beyond the first year who cares? Like some reps still have that outlook. Like, Hey, as long as I get paid on the account, what does it matter? Hey, as long as it gets to back end time and my back end gets paid, that's all that matters to setting the expectation with the customer. Hey, look, um, you're never going to stop mother nature. She's always going to be there. So most of our, customers use us for five to 10 years. I'm going to start you off on a two year plan, but if you see the value, keep us. Most people do. And not even planting the seed of, Hey, cancel when your contract's up, you know, or whatever. So. Interesting. Yeah. That's a, uh, that's an interesting point of view on that. I, uh, we, we have, we have, and I've seen the same issue inside of solar where it's like they just the the professionalism of the sales rep doesn't care um doesn't care about 
you know, anything other than what they get paid, which is one of the reasons why they're not getting referrals, which is one of the reasons why they have such a high cancellation rate and they have to work 10 times harder. If they just worked a little bit smarter and worked as hard, they would, they would get a lot more. One, they'd be more fulfilled Two, They would just make more money. Um, that's, a, that's just a really, yeah, it's a really interesting point of view on that. I, I, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, huh. Yeah. Like I think so many people, um, especially those, like I, I would um, specifically talk, talking to those that are trying to get to the higher level that are your 200, 300, 400 account level reps that are trying to do a, you know, they're trying to be golden door is there's, I, I feel like there's a big misconception um, or faulty belief within the door to door industry that, Hey, if I want to, if I want to sell at a high level and perform and be a golden door rep in any industry, solar pest control, you name it, I've either got to sacrifice some of my values or I've got to throw junk up on the wall. And in pest control, we see this all the time where reps go out and they sell a lot of accounts and, and they, they might get them serviced, but then they, they'll shy away from what their retention is. And, um, and, and, and they might even go into that thinking that that's how, that's what they have to do if they want to achieve that is sell, you know, all the same accounts they were selling before, but now they have to add some crap to it. And I, I don't think you have to add any crap. I think you can have just as good of, you know, quality accounts and still do it at a high level. In fact, there was a time, um, Fox had me and me and my business partner do a training for the entire company. And um, we, we basically called out our entire company on a phone call. And we just said, because this was the year we were selling a lot of accounts. Uh, they asked us to do a training. And I remember, I don't know if it was him or if it was me that said this, but I just said, we said, if you want to be recognized as one of the greatest, you can't just go sell a lot of accounts. You've got to sell a lot of accounts. You've got to sell them at high contract values. You've got to sell high retention and solid accounts. You've got to sell high multi-year accounts. No more one-year accounts. Um, that was one other thing that we learned from the COVID year was um, the importance of selling two-year contracts versus one-year contracts. And so now this past summer, we just got off a of summer where 80, 80, 85% of our total sales as a branch were all two-year contracts uh, because it just sets the right impression and expectation with that customer that, hey, this is a life, this is not just like a try us out type of thing, so. Interesting, so you're telling me that pest control is only a what? Why would somebody sell a, a one-year contract for pest control? Like the bugs just go away? They don't go away. I'm back. That's how they did it for years. I mean, that's how it, you can't sell it. We sold five year contracts with alarms. Why are you selling two one year? Yeah. God, if I sold a one year alarm account, ooh, I would sell everybody, I guess. Hey, one year alarm system. But what do you do? We have to go get our alarm back. Yeah. Why aren't you selling five year? Can you sell a five year? You can. I'm sure some companies will would, would allow you to. You don't really. Is that good or bad? Um, not, not good? Well, like we don't really sell five-year co uh, contracts because we want to, usually you want to up the rate a little bit in a few years, you know? So wow. pest control, you usually want to sell it at a good price and then every year raise their price, you know, three to 4% with inflation. But You can do that with, uh, with their contract or you have to go back out? So if they're in a five-year contract, you wouldn't really be able to raise their price within that one to two years, but on a two year contract. Yeah. Outside of the two years when their two years is up, you know, you can still, you can raise oh, the rate. You. you can raise, raise the rate a little bit. That was very interesting. So you're telling me is that that's an alarm system kind of trick, I guess that people do. I didn't know. I didn't know that uh pest control guys, I guess still do that, but geez, you're telling most, most pest control guys are selling a one year account. Most no wonder where you can go in and just take everything. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the guys are still selling them. I think a lot of companies have started to realize the um, like the statistics behind selling two years. Because if you sell, I think we we did we looked at it and it was like if like a like a, a customer who was sold on a two year contract was sixty percent more likely to stay with your company for three to five years than if they were sold on a one year contract. So companies realize, well, hey, we don't make money in the first year. We really want to make money 
over the long t- over the long haul, they've started to either force or incentivize their sales reps or penalize their sales reps if they don't sell two year contracts. I don't know if I'd ever sell it one year. I'd always sell two, three years. So um, I guess I understand moving the price up or whatever, but why not just move the price up in the first place and sell it to your contract? Like, Nope, exactly. Seems, seems right to me. Um, all right, so sell me on this. Why, why should I sell pest control over solar? Like, let's, let's just get into that. Yeah. Why, why, why pest over solar? Um, you see these solar guys, they're making FU money, right? It's like, they're making great money. Yeah. I, well, hold on. Let me pause there. They're they're claiming they're making f you money. Now, most of them are not. The reason why I know that is because most of them say, "Hey, Mikey, I want to get into your fund," and I go, "Cool. Wire me a hundred grand." They go, "Oh, wait, don't have that." I'm like, "Bro, we talk about Big Check Friday. That's like a standard, right? All these guys making twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars on a Friday, but pest control guys are sneaky." You guys have a lot of money. You keep your money. Yeah. So tell me about what these, I don't know, maybe it's just because the solar guys get it all up front or whatever, but like, why should I be selling? I mean, pest control guys, again, I'll say it again. If, if, if you, if you guys as pest control guys sold year round, you would make more money than probably 95% of the solar industry, even 98% of the solar industry. Why should I be selling pest control over solar? Yeah. Well, I think it depends. Like, um, pest control is very unique in the sense that, like you just said, you, we, we're able to go out for four months or, you know, for some reps, it might be a little longer. Some, some, it might be a little bit shorter, but in that condensed period of time, maximize our earnings greater than any other vehicle in the industry. I mean, we can literally just maximize and for time given to money earned, I feel like that ratio, there's no ratio that's better in the entire industry for time, time given to money earned. And so for me, you know, um, why have I stayed in the pest control industry? Why did I get into the pest control industry is the rest of the year, I wanted to have time to not have to focus on personal earnings, but be able to build something greater, right? So it's like, do you want to always have to go work to get a paycheck or would you rather build something that's going to generate you a paycheck? And oh, by the way, every summer you can still go out and knock doors if you have some time. So that's why you see a lot of guys that do pest that either grow a big network of sales reps and are heavily engaged in the recruiting season, eight months of the year, and then four months of the year they focus on themselves and they go out and sell or they open a branch and you know, achieve a similar outcome um, and build something on paper that they can sell as an asset. So, okay. So now, now, now I'm even more, now I'm even more not, I, I've got even more questions now. Okay. So you're telling me that I can come in, I can start a pest control office. What do you call it? A region? Branch. Branch. Yeah, sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> we were talking solar, solaries. So you're telling me I can start a solar branch. I'm sorry, a pest control branch, which is like a solar office, if you will, under the umbrella of Fox. And not only can I spend, let's just say five months of the year knocking, every, basically six days a week, make the same amount of money as most solar guys are making, probably what, two hundred dollars to $400,000, depending on what my contract value is, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, if not more. Um, depending on obviously, you know, everything. I know there's more factors in that. And then I can start my own branch, recruit, and I'm, I heard res, residual income. In other words, you get paid, because that's what we, we hear that all the time. Are you making money on those 30 year contracts you guys are selling? 25 year contracts you guys are selling? 20 year contracts you're selling? And the answer is no. We get paid on, on the upfront with solar. So you're getting, you're get your, you can, if you build yourself to that point, build an office, build a branch collect money based off. And obviously you went as a business owner, you went through startup capital. You had to put in, you put in a lot of time and effort in your own, in your own uh, sweat equity and, and capital into this thing to start this thing so that you can get, I heard residuals. Is that right? Like basically passive income off of these accounts. Yeah. Essentially it's like, um, that's one of the differences between solar and pest is solar. You make that sale 
And unless something goes wrong with that system, that transaction's done. You know, you're not gonna, the, the customer's never going to see the company again. She's never going to see the sales rep or the name of the company unless something goes wrong. Um, in pest control, you're building a relationship, and that transaction is day, is only the beginning of that relationship. It's not the beginning and the end, in essence. And so you do see a lot of pest control sales reps that go out and they, they sell 200, 500, however many accounts, uh, but they're selling it for their company, and they're making money on that account on whatever the contract value was for year one. But how much more powerful would it be if you, let's just say you didn't make much on the account the, year, the first year of that customer, but that customer stayed with the company for five years. And oh, by the way, you have an equity stake in that company that for the entire five years, you're taking a portion of what that customer's paying for their pest control services. So that's where the residual comes from. It's not like indefinite residual because if that customer falls off, or cancel service with the with the company, you're no longer making a profit on that on that account. But you're always replacing that account and always constantly trying to trying to build that. So there's like there's three ways, like at least where I was that these last few years being a branch owner, there's three ways I made money. One is personal commissions. If I had time or I made time, I'd go out and I'd knock and, and try to sell some accounts of my own. Whether that's on a Saturday with, you know, the sales reps just to kind of show them, hey, I can still throw down. You guys can throw down. Like here's like show them their vision and open up their vision to what what's possible. Um, two is your branch profits, you know, and, and how your branch is making money if you're out of debt. And then three is what is your business worth, right? If you owned, you know, a business that was doing in the multiples of millions of dollars and you were to sell that business, well, what would someone pay for that business? And oh, you're an equity shareholder of that business, you get you know a take home. So building something on paper, like I'll, I'll, I'll never forget our first year we opened a branch, I didn't make anything from the branch because we were still in debt, we were still just growing, growing, growing. But on paper, now we've built a business that's doing millions and millions of dollars. What is that worth, you know, so. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think I think that's one of the biggest issues that I see YouTube stars um, and TikTok, you know, tax strategies and TikTok, all those guys over on TikTok, um, not telling people is uh, when you start a business, um, you likely will make no money. You likely, especially in the first five years, are like damn near guaranteed you're going to lose and you're going to shut down. Oh man, it's just, it's actually like really annoying when you, when, when the wrong expectation was given to a young entrepreneur and then you have to tell them straight up that it's like, Hey man, it's not like that. Like, no, that's not how this is going to be. You're more than likely going to lose money your first two, three years. Now only in like, as a, as a sales rep, maybe, which is why it's funny because a lot of times and it's probably like the same way, same way, same way at Fox that a lot of the reps are like, I'm going to open my own branch. It's the same thing we get in solar and roofing. Okay. And every other windows, pat, I mean, you know, alarms, same thing. I'm going to, I'm going to start my own dealer. Not realizing that when you start your own dealer, you're actually now exposing yourself. Cause everyone's like this whole like millennial gen Z's, we want to be the CEO. We want to be in control. We want to be in charge. And it's the most frustrating thing in the entire world when a sales rep forgets the fact that you, Marshall, had to go through and build this whole thing out and gave them a platform to do that. And they think that they can do your job. Now, don't get me wrong. I was that guy that thought I could do my general manager, my vice president, my v president's job now i was right but i am not i am few and far from i'm like i'm the outlier i was told that i was going to fail but i'm a weed i keep growing back you cannot stop me i'm going to continue like they like, bro like nothing is going to stop mikey lucas it's just it's just i just keep going um i keep adapting i keep you know of evolving if you will even but there's it's so frustrating when when the the, the the stars on YouTube and TikTok are 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 
telling a false narrative to our generation that it's just going to be easy. Um, you make a lot more money as a sales rep and you do, but we all want to be branch owners. We all want to be dealers. We all want to own our own company. Like you already own your own company fool. Like you, you have money coming in money going out and you, you can't even, you can't even balance that. Your P and L looks like crap. Looks negative. So tell me, yeah, man, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts around that, but it's just, I think it's destroying. I think there's this narrative that we got to be the owner. It's destroying. Is that happening in pest control too, where everyone's like, I want to start my own branch. Yeah, you do get a lot of it where um, these young guys come in who they've got all the ambition in the world, right? All the ambition. And yep. that's a good thing to have, but you have to kind of plant their feet back on the ground at times, you know, Hey, I want to sell a thousand accounts like their first year. And it's like, well, hang on a second. Do you realize, like, if you saw what it took to do that, you might not want to go do that. Like, uh, the sacrifice, the loneliness that we talked about, you know, like, everything you're going to have to give up. Same thing with being a branch owner or starting your own dealer. It's like, it is for some people, but it's not for most people. Um, and that's why you see, you'll see a lot of people that talk the talk. And they won't ever actually go do that because uh, they want the outcome, but they're not willing to put in the input that requ that is required to get that outcome. And, um, but it's, it's, yeah, no, I, I'm completely with you. I think it's, it's unfortunate that there's a lot of that happening, like almost a sense of entitlement. I don't know if it's just the newer generations, the millennials, which I'm probably part of the millennial. I don't even know what I am, but, um, sense of entitlement that like, you know, what he has should be mine, you know, but um, go get it. Like there's good and bad with that. I always look at things in life, like from both angles, Where, what good can I see in it? And what bad can I see in it? The good is, hey, he, he has the perspective that what one man can do, another can do. And that's a valuable perspective because we really are not that much different from each other. Um, but then the entitlement side of it, it's like, no, you need to, you need to be willing to do what it's required. So. Yeah. Roger Bannister beat the four minute mile after that, you know, tons of people hit it. Right. So I agree with you on that when it comes to, I, I think the ambition, uh, I think the crazy, you know, big, hairy, audacious goals. I think, you know, if, if, if your goal, if God doesn't have to show up in your goals and I think you need to go back to the drawing board, you know, um, if you're not having some crazy audacious goals, I get, I get that, but I, I do agree with you on the, you know, having to humble people and get, bring them, bring their feet back down. Um, I listened to a lot of, uh, I listened to a lot of, uh, David Goggins and, um, recently and, um, uh, Tim Grover. And I read the book winning recently with a lot of my, a lot of my, um, the golden door guys that I coach right now. And we all went through it. And, and one of the, one of the big things that stood out to me was, you know, how much you have to, like, everyone wants, you know, I want to be the next, I want, I want, I don't want seven rings. I want eight rings. I'm the next Tom Brady, not realizing how much they have to sacrifice to go through that. I, I this past weekend, actually, I was in San Diego and a big mastermind event. Um, um, so it was about a hundred of us there and, and we're going through, we're getting taught by the top guys in this industry, you know, eight, nine, 10 figure business owners. And, it was interesting to see because it was almost like a trap. One of them was setting, one of the speakers was setting and it was like, you know, yes, dream bigger. And he was like, yeah, dream big, dream big, dream big. Right. And some guys were like coming back and like, yeah, I want to go. I'm stuck, man. I'm, I'm at, I'm at eight figures. I want to go to nine figures. You know, I made, you know, $72 million this year in revenue. I want to get to a hundred million. And he's like, well, well, why? And it was really cool because then some of the guys in the group would, would, would ask like, are you sure you want that? And would, would, would like negotiate with us. Like, man, like why is it just cause the number, like you've got two little girls, a beautiful marriage. Like why, why nine, why nine figures? Why a thousand accounts? And it, it, it was really interesting to see how, um, how after the weekend, that one guy that he was, they were talking to specifically, he was, you know, the, the, the dummy that raised his hand. Right. But it was really cool. Not the dummy in a bad way, but like, you know, the one guy that got picked on after that, I saw a lot of people like kind of like real, I had conversations with people about it 
And people started to realize like, do you have to set like, are, am I willing, like you said, am I willing to sacrifice what this is to get to that top level? And most people, I don't think I heard Eric Thomas say this. I don't think anybody ever in the beginning was like, yeah, I'm going to get straight F's when they went into college. Right. But the result um, of what they put in was F's and D's, right? Everyone's like, I'm going to get A's and B's or A's, right? Yeah. So, yeah, what, what, oh man, I don't know. I, I, I don't think, I think our generation is, what's funny is, is, is our generation is, is a lot smarter than a lot of people make it sound like we are. Um, we're a lot further advanced as far as technology. Everyone's like, oh yeah, your faces are always in these phones. Well, don't be jealous, buddy, uh, that our faces are on our phones all the time. Uh, we're, we're actually more connected uh, than, than you guys ever were and ever will be. So, you know, now, now it's funny. Ten years later, they all have Facebook, all the <laughs> older generation. They're like, you know, all over it. It's really funny because they're like, hey, MySpace and Instagram, you know. Now they're all now they're all hooked on it. Now all they're they're driving with their phones with on Facebook. Now they can't get enough of it. Anyways, I, I don't don't make me fight for my, for the millennials because I will. Um, I think we get a bad rap for one, but yeah, we we've got a lot more ambition. I I know that I know that if we have the right ambitions and we have the right leaders like like you, Marshall, around us, that you, you're probably creating these outstanding sales reps. Um, I mean, it's, it's not easy to be, to, to be a golden door award winner here in 2022 and also run a branch like you are. And you did that. So let's transition. Tell me about this past year. You hit a golden door, you're running your own branch. You recruited a bunch of guys. What did that look like? Yeah. So, I mean, I didn't actually, like, it was never a goal. I'm I'm kind of anti goal in a sense. I think goals are very powerful, but I but I think wow. they can also um, hold you back. Like sometimes I wonder, you know, my first year I set the goal that I was going to do 600 accounts, and then I changed that goal to doing a thousand, and then I changed that a second time to doing 1200. That I look back and I say, well, how many could I have done if I had just looked like r raised my vision? and set a goal for 1500, 2000, right? So I think there, there's a lot of power in them, but there's also a lot of, there's, there's some bad in them as well. And so this, this past summer, I, I went out and I, I, I had a, I guess you could say a chip on my shoulder um, that, hey, what I did in getting Golden Door was not a fluke. Um, and I'm gonna go do it again, but oh, by the way, I'm gonna do it knocking part-time and running a, a multi-million dollar business. Um, and I didn't like, it didn't kind of realize into a goal until partway through the summer. Like I, I had it on the back of my mind that, hey, how cool, of, how cool of an idea would that be to go do that? But I'm not going to sacrifice my business to go spend all this time on the doors because my time is better spent building my business than it is on the doors. Um, but there's also a fine line between, well, at what point are you just working in your business or on your business when you could actually be out there in the trenches with your sales reps working from the front? And so it right. was extremely, um, stressful to have to balance both of those hats. Um, you know, I've talked to guys, I'm like, dude, I would rather go sell 2000 accounts and only have to wear one hat and turn off my phone. And just go sell, you know, every day for however many months it took, than to have to wear the hat of business owner all morning, and then put on the hat of sales rep, and then take it off halfway through the day or partway through the evening when I get a phone call, and just constant distractions and everything else, you know. Um, yeah. I think that's why you oftentimes hear like managers don't be a manager for the money, do it for the leadership, right? Because it might pay you well to be a sales manager of a solar team or of a pest control team. But if you don't like to manage people, the money will not be worth it, you know? And, uh, and so that was super stressful, but, um, partway through the summer, I, I kind of realized, Hey, I actually have a dang good chance of getting this thing. Um, and kind of did some math and realized, Hey, okay, 
I, I need however much more revenue to go do it. And, uh, we, at the end of the summer, we went to Cancun. Uh, we do our leadership summit out there at the end of the summer with all our sales reps. And I got asked by a couple people, so are you still going to go get golden door? You only need, I think I needed, uh, 160 or 170,000 in revenue, um, to go get it. And I was like, ah, I don't know. We'll see. And, um, while in Cancun, I booked a flight to go back out on the doors. I booked a Airbnb and I booked a rental car for exactly three weeks. And I said, I've got to go do this in three weeks because it's starting to get to the point of what's more important, my business or this Golden Door Award, <laughs> you know? And I went out and I actually had the best three weeks of my sales career. I sold uh, just over 200 accounts in three weeks and um needed every every second of those those three weeks to get it but got it the last got it the last day and uh jumped on my flight and came home so let's go let's go dude you just turned it on yeah it was nice it was nice because after what i what i left out is during those three weeks all i could focus on was selling because the team had already completed their summer like the Cancun is the end of the summer. So we had no more sales reps out there. It was just me, no distractions for three weeks, just being able to throw down. So, wow. yeah. Talk, talk me through that. What was going on in your mind? Like you had to hit 200 accounts in three weeks. Was there any self doubt that, that came in and crept in and said, screw it. Let me just go home. Cause as most, most guys that listen to the show here and girls actually run offices too. Yeah. So, so what, what was that like? Like, where was your head at? Like you had to have. Like it was in a space. I deal with a lot of anxiety and, uh, I, and it, the anxiety is one of those words in this industry you hear a lot of with sales reps. Um, but I, I've learned to just embrace it and, and kind of harness it in a, in a positive direction. And so I felt a lot of anxiety, a lot of pressure, because I didn't want to have to extend a flight. I didn't want to have to extend my Airbnb. I had three weeks and it came, it came right down to the wire to get it. Um, but I'm also a big believer that if you say you're going to do something and you, you, you just decide, um, that, that, that is the most important action in itself is deciding. Cause once you've decided everything else, you'll figure out. But if, if, if people kind of have a goal, but it's not quite really their goal, um, they haven't truly decided this is what I want and get out of my way. Like you're going to, you're going to have self doubt. You're going to have, you're going to make excuses, you know, but, um, no, it was great. Um, my process, I realized, um, in those three weeks, how much money I'd left on the table my first summer by not having a, a really good process. So during those three weeks, I'd wake up at seven o'clock sharp and my, my first, my hand was on my first door, knocking the door at eight thirty every single morning. And what was, what was tough was in the beginning, I thought, oh eight thirty, that's early. Like I was waking some people up. No, like people are up and, yes, and they're, are. they're ready to buy. And, um, I had to get on the doors early because one of the challenges was it got dark at six o'clock. So I lost two hours on the back end. I needed to make up for them on the front end and get on the doors as early as I possibly could. So interesting. Yeah. I've got a, uh, I've got a golden door award winner that I coached and trained brought into the industry. His name's Daniel Dobas hit golden door this year, hit very close to it last year. Um, got rookie of the year and sales rep of the year at his company. And uh, the one thing I told him that I said, look, you know, he, I guess he asked me, he was like, Hey man, like, how do I, how do I basically be the 1%? I said, you're on doors at 9am. Like, like, not like, like you, no, like you, you touch the first door at 9am. You're, you're there. You're ready to go. You're not like, you know, stop having, you, you turn Eric Thomas off and you're actually on the doorstep bringing the first door about 9am six days a week. And the kid did that. Yeah. And it was really interesting to see what happened 
uh, within our offices when this kid would be ding appointment, ding appointment, ding, ding, ding before our first meeting at 11 or nine, whatever it was at that time. So you're out there at 830 knocking on doors. Are, is that a standard for you guys now? I mean, what, I mean, is if that, obviously that works, everyone's like, oh, people don't buy at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, yeah, they do. Yeah. Is that what you guys, you have your guys out there doing right now? It's, t- or what, what is that? It's like? tough. We do our, we do our meetings in the morning. You've got a lot to balance, right? Cause you have, you have your high level sales reps, but then you also have members of the team that aren't in that place of mind um, or that place in time and experience that, are willing to make those type of sacrifices. You put everybody through that routine and very few are making it out the other end. Um, so it, it takes the right type of person. We do have sales reps that, hey, if you don't want to come to the, the morning meeting, you don't need to, but you need to be on the doors. And you need, you need to be yeah. on the doors before the meeting begins because I don't want people asking me, hey, where's so-and-so? Oh, no, he's on the doors. Oh, you want to trade him spots? Okay, you can go on the doors too if you want. No, I'd rather be, I'd rather be here in a meeting, (laughs) you know? So there's that. The way I've, the way I recently um, have started to look at it is if I ask you, Hey, you've got to eat a frog. You've got to eat one frog every day. Where would you put it in your day? Would you eat it for breakfast? Would you eat it for dinner? Would you eat it for lunch? Where would you want to place that frog? Probably me right now. Right in the beginning. Right in the beginning of the day. And that's your first, that's like your first door is for anybody that deals with anxiety. Like I do, like, don't wait. Don't. Yeah. The build up to think about how I have to eat a frog at the end of the day. No, I'd rather just just wake up and eat the frog and starting your day that same way, wake up and get on the doors as early as you can. It just makes the day go so much better. I love that. Yeah, no, I, I, I see that. It's complicated because you're right. It is complicated. So I understand that. But at the same time, I've seen companies that I've consulted or coached and it's like, you know, they're having meetings at one o'clock in the afternoon, solar specific. And it's almost like they're not making their guys like knock before that. And then they're only knocking the two, three hours, you know, in the afternoon after the meeting, after they have a second lunch or lunch. And then they wonder why they're only selling three deals a month or four deals a month. And I'm like, because you're missing half the day. Like what, what did you expect here? Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of missed opportunities within the first, you know, five hours of a day. I mean, I break my days into three. I learned that from my mentor, Ed Milet, break my days into three. Um, I'm about to be finishing my second day here. Um, at the top of the hour. So, you know, I'm going into day three, day three of this, this one day here. Um, and I think breaking that up is, uh, is key. Let me, let me close back um, this, this financial situation we'll, we'll, and then we'll end there. Um, starting a pest control branch, got the word, starting a pest control branch. You're telling me that you're what, like, generally speaking, talk to me like I'm a first year sales mm-hmm. rep. Not like I'm a multi-year guy. Talk to me like I'm first-year sales rep so we can keep the numbers really simple. If I was, if I was a first-year sales rep and, I, and you go, hey, look, Mikey, look, if you come over to, if you come over to Pest, um, you start your own branch, this is kind of what you can make. Like, what does that look like? Is it a dollar amount per? Is it a percent per, um, per account? Like, what is that? What, what do you sell? Like, Convince me as a solar guy that, hey, look, Mikey, you can come over, but but talk me in like the, the, the low numbers. I'm trying to like give you some lead yeah. here so you don't have to give the big numbers. Give me the low numbers. Well, so, you know, in pest control, um, you've got multiple positions you can play, right? You can be a sales rep and you can be a sales rep for a pest control company. You can be a sales rep for a solar company, security company. A lot of companies will hire you as a sales rep. That is a position. Um, in which you're selling accounts, you're making commissions, but you're, you're selling those accounts for someone else to own and you don't own those customers or those accounts. You sold them. And that transaction was made between the company and yourself that you were going to get paid a certain commission for that account. Say it's 300 bucks. Um, 
then you can become a recruiter and um, bring in people and, and make money on their accounts that they sell. You can be a manager. If you successfully sell, recruit, and manage a sales team, and you want to invest capital and, and go more long-term, you can become a branch owner. A branch owner, what's different is you actually, you're on the other end of that commission transaction. You're paying your sales reps commission for them to go out and knock on doors, either A, so you don't have to go knock doors, or B, because if you get 10 sales reps to go sell 100 accounts, there's a thousand in itself, and you might not be a thousand account level rep. You might not be able to go do Golden Door, and not every Golden Door guy would make the best branch owner. But there's also some great branch owners that would never hit Golden Door. Um, it's a different type of leadership skill set that's required. And say you go out and you get uh, 20 guys to go do uh, 200 accounts apiece because you trained them well. Well, that that's 4,000 accounts. That's going to be roughly about $3 million in reoccurring revenue that you put into your business. That as long as those customers stay active and you continue to replace them, you'll have some fall off, but you'll replace them year after year with a new sales team. That's $3 million in revenue that you're a part owner of that branch. Well, let's just assume, uh, let's go conservative, 20% profit margin on that. Well, what's 20% of 3 million in revenue? That's $600,000, right? $600,000. And if you're, say, even a 25% owner of that branch, that's $200,000 a year that you'll continue to make as long as your customer base stays at the size of $3 million reoccurring. It won't. You can build that branch and continue to build the sales reps to come back the next year with their friends and continue to build that from $3 million to $6 million to $9 million to $18 million. And while you do that, you're going to build your income as a branch owner. But even in that first year, you did $3 million. But right now, there's companies being sold between $2 and supposedly some as high as $4 on the dollar. So a $3 million company that you built in one year of taking 20 sales reps to do 200 accounts a piece at a $2 multiple, not a four, but a $2 million is $6 million evaluation on your business. If you're a 25% owner of that business, you made $1.5 million in one year, plus a residual income of $200,000 a year. Yeah. So what are I sign up? <laughs> that's a, uh, that's a, uh, that's a hell of a business strategy right there, bro. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to figure out a way to do that within my own companies. Um, I, I, I ended up figuring it out, figuring it out after the fact, but that was one of my goals was how do we cut in guys? Cause a company I used to work for who now just recently sold called Solcius solar. This is where I met Sam Taggart at. Um, originally gave us $25 in install as long as we are with the company. So that was kind of nice. Some little residuals. I teach companies, if you want to talk about retention, that's like the best way to retain your guys is to, is to give them some sort of a residual. Does Fox offer residual or pay for, to keep their sales reps around? Do you have to like, is that like a, a creative financing or creative way to do that, to keep guys around instead of like being recruited to whatever company out there, XYZ, pest control? Is that one thing you guys do or not? Yeah, so it's... it's you have to do that? Is that even a thing? That we, we just completely revamped our entire pay structure this last year um, in terms of personal commission rates, overrides, how recruiting, managing, all that works. Um, there are some incentives for especially recruiters or managers to continue to make um, a, a passive income on their network of guys that they have beyond, the th beyond just the first year. So if a sales rep sells and uh, somebody so-and-so recruited them, well, he's got some incentive to continue to build that organization year after year after year because of, a, of, a, of an ongoing um, commission rate. Uh, there's also incentive with selling a two-year contract versus a one-year contract. If you sell a one-year contract, you only get commission on the first year. If you sell a two-year contract in pest control, we pay an additional commission percentage on the second year of that contract. But we don't have nice. three, four, five year like in like 
continually ongoing residuals in place in that sense. And I think it's one of those topics where I remember, I won't say the company, I had a, I had a buddy, he was selling for a company and, and he had got, you know, he had drinking a little bit too much from the, the, the residual Kool-Aid as I call it. Right. Cause I, I had to break it down to him and it ended up making sense. He ended up leaving the company where I just said, Hey, would you, if I offered you a $20,000 today, um, to go out and go knock for a week or I offered you $20 a, a, a week for the next hundred weeks to go knock for one week, which would you prefer? Everyone's going to take the $20,000 today, right? Some people have that mindset of like, oh, it's a residual income. Well, usually they're just paying it either on the front end or the back end, however you, however you slice right. it, right? Because that money's coming from somewhere. So I, right. don't, I just don't believe that one company is able to do something that another company is not in terms of finances, yeah. unless one company just yeah. doesn't have their stuff together. And Fox... Yeah, that's some, that's some Bernie Madoff stuff. <laughs> some, some, pon some actual Ponzi kinks. Yeah, exactly. Stuff. And so I, I, but I know Fox's finances, and I would I would put Fox up there with any company in terms of their financial stability and where nice. they're at and how they've managed their money in terms of like deals and stuff. So we're not. And you guys have a really, really good reputation in the industry that I've heard, so that's good and seen on the internet. Yeah, so. that's great. Awesome. So okay. I, I like I like that. So because I, I was like, wait a second, I didn't I didn't get the number. I'm like, I'm now I'm now I'm confused. Now I want to know this number. So, um, yeah, golly, if I would if I would have known that, I probably would have sold pest control. Um, it's really funny talking with a lot of the uh, so a lot of the the top one percent of the solar pros that I that I coach. Um, I have to take pliers and pull the. Um, I'm gonna say this in a nice way because I, I definitely don't say it in a nice way when I'm on the phone with them. But I have to pull the. Um, the stocks options, if you will, out of their mouth. Uh, so you know where I'm going with that probably. Um, I have to pull these stock option, you know, residual income kind of thing out of their mouth. Um, because when they're talking to me, I'm like, do you realize this doesn't make sense? Have you heard of anybody that's ever got this payout? Not that it hasn't happened before. My mentor, Dave Allred, has gotten paid millions of dollars from Vivint when that happened. So I've seen it. But you've heard the other story of, that doesn't happen or the company never sells or whatever, because um, a, a guy that I'm in his mastermind, Joel Marion uh, will, will tell you as well that it is very, very, very complicated to get purchased. I mean, it's like so complicated to get bought by a venture capitalist company, VC company, like it private company. Like it is very, very complicated to take them to IPO a company like that. Like if you're not doing it correctly from the very beginning, whew, very complicated to get bought. Um, not that it doesn't happen because it does, but it's, it's likely it's not going to happen, but it's hard to get these, the, the, the stock options out of these guys' mouths, uh, to be able to talk with them, talk with things through things rationally. Um, but that's cool. I mean, I think it's, I think it's awesome. I think, uh, if I could have done that in solar, I definitely would have done that. Like, yeah, let's, 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 let's build that in. Um, and you're right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's coming from somewhere and yeah, I'm, I don't know. I always say this to people all the time like you know should i take this deal um jg wentzworth 877 cash now uh does not sponsor this show but i'm a jg wentzworth guy i want my money it's my money and i want it now i don't want to be paid in stock options in seven years from now i did not get any money from my solar city stocks um at all ever don't even know if they're still there um when we got bought by tesla and, uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't know, man, I, I didn't, we didn't, we didn't receive anything from that. So I guess I could have some stocks out there it would be really smart if I should go find those. But from my understanding, we didn't get those. We forfeited those cause they fired us. Um, anyways, the, yeah, that's really cool. So awesome. Let me, let me transition and then we can end here. Tell me about your real estate. Cause I know that, um, obviously as you're running your business, um, just give me a ballpark. What it like, don't tell me exactly, but you know, is it over $10,000 a month? Is it $20,000 a month? Is it $30,000 a month? Like, what are you at now within your company? And what's your goal as far as like the passive income? Cause again, I know that it goes up and down. It's like multi-level marketing where it's like, Hey, if you're one branch, it's really funny how multi-level marketing guys, I'm, I'm a multi-level marketing guy myself. I started in, as I when I was 17 selling video phones through ACN. So if anybody remembers that, it's, you should laugh because it's really funny. Um, that was like the year that Skype came out. It, it failed dramatically it's a lot of them but anyways had one it was really cool i want to facetime my family in new york let's get them the phone <laughs> one person buys they all gonna buy anyways it fails 
in a, in, a, in 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 multi level marketing, the guys what most people don't get it's the same thing pulling the stock option thing out of their mouth. Same same verbiage um, is that if that leg dies, you no longer get residual income from that leg anymore. Like if the, if, if you don't if that leg gets recruited somewhere else to some other multi level marketing company, you're no longer getting residual from that. So it's understandable that we as business professionals, business owners know that we have to continue to go out and get sales, um, which I think that again, it's tainted. I think honestly, a lot of it comes from the multi-level marketing industry. It's like, hey, it's tainted us to want to retire. Um, and, uh, and it's funny because I have a lot of clickbait that says, hey, I'll teach you how to retire in three to five years or five to seven years, whatever ad they're looking at. I, I do talk like that, but I mean, I mean it differently than they mean it. I mean, they literally mean retire to never work ever again. I don't mean to never work ever again. I believe that God built us to work. Um, I just mean to retire from that specific position, fire yourself and move up and give more and live more. Tell me a little bit about, so answer that question first. What, what roughly, what do you make? Like where you're at now, now three years into your own branch. What, is, what does that look like? Is that per year, per month? Like, give me a estimate. What do you make as a residual? Cause again, yeah. I know it goes up, goes down, project values, but just roughly, roughly, what is that? What is well, that? Well, like? we've never, we've never in full transparency, we've never had it go down. Um, so, so in the history, you're just, you're just adding, you're just adding. It's, more it's either staying thing. roughly the same or it's, go, it's usually going up. So you should, you should go to the church and teach them how to retain their people because that, they, we need that. Yeah, too. yeah no, exactly. Um, we got two people, four people going out the back. But Anyways, keep going. No, I mean, so like of Fox's 12 years being in business, they've never once to the state had a branch that shrunk in size. Either that, sh that branch, you know, had a good enough sales team to kind of maintain its current size or it grew. Um, right now we're, we're looking at, I mean, I'm personally, I'm, um, from the residual side, somewhere between 25 to 35 a month, um, nice. in profits. And then, you know, whatever I sell. So like this last year I sold, you know, 854 accounts. Um, yeah. that's, I could either wait, you know, four or five years to continue to, to see a small residual impact of that. Or what oftentimes a lot of branch owners will do is they will pay themselves a commission out of their business on, on any All personal right. sales. Just like if you watch Shark Tank, you know, hey, are you paying yourself anything? Yeah, I pay myself a small, I don't pay myself like I'm a high level sales rep. Um, I usually pay myself yeah. about 40% commission on any personal nice. sales that I make, just cause that's 40% is where you wanna keep your branch. Uh, in, in terms of yeah. being in a in a good spot financially, so I did I did the same thing. Yep. Awesome. Good to know. Nice, dude. That's freaking awesome. Um, and obviously, yeah, dude. I I, I obviously wish you the success. Um, you're obviously killing it. So if there's any way that I can help you, obviously I would love to um to jam. If you have if you need anybody that you need to talk crap to because you know the the business is going down around you and you need help, <laughs> uh, don't be afraid to call me now that you have my number. So. Um, talk, let me, let me ask you this. You, you said, you said you have a really, um, you, you have a keen for, for real estate. Um, how are you investing right now? Are you investing money right now? What does that look like? Yeah, I love real estate. So, um, two years ago I got, I got, I bought my first property, um, kind of house hack, yeah. lived in it, converted it into a duplex, put a mother-in-law apartment in the basement. Um, and then just recently, as of this year, I just closed and moved in on more of a primary residence home that I'm going to make my own, you know, for the next little bit. Um, but no, I'm actually, I think you mentioned something about a fund. So I'm working with a few guys that are pretty real estate savvy on, cre on creating nice. a fund. And uh, right now I'm just stockpiling though, um, because I, I'd like to see what happens. I think now is a great time to continue to buy real estate. I don't know so much with, but especially the stock market, these next two to three years, I think you're going to see a lot of buying opportunities. And I think you could see it in real estate in some other markets. Um, I, my attention has definitely went outside of Utah as of the last few years. Um, I feel like Utah has kind of, um, its potential for appreciation is not quite the same as some other markets. Um, so, like Philadelphia? <laughs> not Philadelphia. <laughs> I have, well, maybe. I haven't looked into Philadelphia. Outside of, outside of Philadelphia, my partner's got a lot of, uh, probably 20 units oh, or really? so in Philadelphia. Oh, okay. Yeah. Huh. That's cool. 
I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Detroit guy. I'm going to cut you off. I'm a no, Detroit guy. That's where I'm, that's, that's where a lot, you talk about the appreciation when you're buying a house for five grand, it's pretty hard not to yeah, appreciate. Yeah. Well, in five grand, you're going to cash flow a pretty high percentage on, you know? So, um, yeah. but no, we're, we're working on something right now. It's a, it's a fund, you know, it'll be a, a accessible to a lot of our door to door sales reps, at least in my net, in my right. network, um, you know, to be able to, gain more tax depreciation, accelerated tax depreciation, things of that sort. So yeah. Yeah. awesome. It'll be something similar to like a fund of funds, in other words, or it's like a, where you can invest in kind of not anything, but pretty much anything like a fund they call that a fund of funds where you can, is it going to be like solely real estate or is it, are you able to invest into other things as well? So no, it'll be solely real estate. I mean, there might be a, I, we're looking at probably like a 10% share of like unique opportunities. So um, but primarily real estate, um, different projects, you know, throughout the United States, the guys I've worked with. So, yeah, if you ever want to jam off, off uh, offline, I, uh, I've got, I've started two funds myself, so, uh, I've been through it all, <laughs> uh, you know, good lawyers, bad lawyers, good deals, bad deals, the whole nine yards. So I've, uh, I've, I'm invested personally over, over a half million dollars into other people's funds and syndications. So, uh, some of them went really well and some of them went really bad. Um, so there's, there's a lot to, there's a lot to know, uh, when it comes to that. So if you ever need any help with that, please don't, don't feel free to, to reach out. I can point you in the right direction, a lot of stuff too. So I'm excited about, um, what you're going to do there and helping out your guys. You know, I, one of the big things that I I'm passionate about is helping, helping the door to door industry, um, not just go out and make a bunch of money, but to keep up, keep a bunch of their money. Um, cause I believe as entrepreneurs, we're the ones that can actually change the world. Uh, we need, we need to keep our money. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm all for everyone owning their Rolls Royce Bugattis and Ferraris and Rolexes. But at the end of the, at the end of the day, I think that we need to make sure that we're, we're making an impact in the world, making our money matter um, and giving back a lot of our money as well to, to make sure that we're making a difference. So well, and, if I can and help it you drives me nuts. I see, um, well, like today there's a lot of door to door sales companies that, um, they'll bring in so and so to speak on real estate, or they they have a partnership with X company that does real estate, right? But if you look into their leaders, or you look into the top performers at said company, it's kind of like closed curtains. Like, are are they just spending their money? Are they investing it? What are they doing? And do they know what they're doing, or are they just kind of contributing to something else? You know, or investing their money and giving it over to somebody who has a fund, right? Versus right. like for yeah. me, th th that's been a big point is I want to be, um, I don't want to be a know-it-all, but I want to be the guy that my reps can always come to and say, dude, I know you know a lot about real estate. Um, I want, this is what I'm looking to do. And if I don't know them, I know, uh, if I don't know what to, how to help you, I know somebody who can help you type of a, you know, situation yeah, exactly. and just open up the curtains open up the curtains in terms of, you know, what I'm doing real estate wise, investment wise, and how to not just spend your money on Bugattis and Rolexes and nice things, you know, but how to actually get that financial independency. So. I love that. Awesome, brother. Well, Marshall, it's been a, uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, I appreciate your time. I know that our listeners got a lot of value out of this. Um, I, I mean, I love the be effective rather than versus being affected. That really, that really, resonated with me. Um, also the fact that you went from solar to pest control and now you're making 20 plus thousand dollars a month in basically residual income. It's kind of, kind of cool. Not, 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 uh, not happening in, in solar. I'll tell you that. I'm one of the only guys that I know that has over $20,000 a month in passive income right now. And you're doing that with your day-to-day -day job. <laughs> it's like, it's just cool to, to hear that. So congratulations to you, brother. I, I, I wish you the best. I appreciate it. Um, where, where can our, where can our, uh, where can our fans and followers, um, and students, um, find you at man. If they want to stay in touch with you and follow your journey. Yeah. Uh, not super active on social media, but they could follow me at, uh, just Marshall underscore Hawks 20 on Instagram. Probably the best place. So awesome. And are you connected on LinkedIn as well? Uh, I am. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So it's just, just Marshall Hawks. Yeah. Same Marshall thing, Hawks. Yeah. You'll find me on LinkedIn as well. So. Awesome. Perfect. 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 Well, cool brother. Um, any, any, uh, final words for the golden door award winners out there? No, everybody who won it, big congrats. Uh, it's awesome to see happening. Um, excited to see what the next step for those guys are, is, um, you know, 
and uh, who's to come. So awesome. Well, cool, brother. I appreciate your time. It's been a uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Good to know that uh, you're keeping your money and investing it well. So um, thank you, and uh, I hope you have an outstanding hey, year this year. Thank you, Mikey. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on the call. My pleasure. Yes, sir. Have a good one, brother.